Coming up on this week's show, we've got a huge announcement to tell you about. Sega's saucy lost FMV game is found. And we get the history of Guitar Hero and Rock Band with Mike Dornbro. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each and every Friday with our amazing friends at Bitmap Books. Now, their latest book just looks incredible. Bitmap Books presents I'm Too Young to Die, The Ultimate Guide to First-Person Shooters, 1992 to 2002, celebrating more than 180 games of what is now the biggest gaming genre in the world. Check out the entire history of it and pre-orders begin to ship a bit later this month. You can pre-order right now at bitmapbooks.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 352, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And great to have you joining us for another hour-ish where we take you on a journey inside the world of classic video games. Bringing you up to speed on all the happenings in the world of retro from over the last week. And of course, a veteran of the industry on the second half of the show for an exclusive interview. And we've got an amazing one for you this week. Now, we'll tell you more about that in just a bit. Before we do, though, I must admit, you know, it's we've done this podcast for seven years. It's not very often that I get nervous recording an episode of the Retro Hour now. But today, we're finally ready to launch something that we've been working on pretty much non-stop for at least the last year. Yeah, we've been working on this behind the scenes for at least a year, but I think it's been in planning for about five. So um, <laughs> what we're going to do is we're actually kickstarting a Retro Hour book. Yeah, man, this is uh, absolutely incredible. So this is actually launching on Kickstarter uh, today, the 11th of November, ah. um, running for the, the next month. Um, so physical manifestation of the podcast in book form. And yeah, just absolutely super excited, super nervous and super thankful that it's it's finally here after all this hard work. Now, I can't begin to describe the amount of work that we've put into this. And actually, most of the book is pretty much already written, isn't it? You know, there's um, a lot of extras in there too that we'll tell you about in just a moment. Now, I've got to say, you know, beyond our control, we do appreciate that we've probably picked the worst time in human history yeah. to launch a Kickstarter um, with everything that's going on in the world. But honestly, we think you're going to be blown away by what we've done in this book. Now, to give you the title of it, it's going to be called The Retro Hour, The History of Video Gaming from Those That Made It Happen, which really I thought, I mean, we thought long and hard about what the, the title of the book should be. And I think that really sums up what we aim to do when we launched this podcast all those years ago and what we've continued to be most proud of. Yeah, I, I absolutely love the selection of interviews we've got in there. So we've got interviews. We've also got exclusive features. We've got a lot of stuff that's going to be coming up as well during the Kickstarter that we're going to announce. And we've got some amazing stuff like unique art that is done by David Rowe. And oh my God, you, you may remember Nightmare the TV show. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> David did the backgrounds of those, but he airbrushed them by hand. Like this was, you know, absolutely beautiful work. He also did old Robocod as well. James Pond. So yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really excited about that. David's working on the um, piece and he's worked on the contact with us and this is all going to be, you know, announced throughout the Kickstarter and it's going to be hand drawn. Oh, I can't wait for you guys to see this. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we've, we've seen some of kind of like the early, artwork of it and stuff like that and it just looks phenomenal and you know we're really really making sure that this is like a really premium sized coffee table book i think it's over 400 pages in the end um and yeah. it's just going to look really really beautiful you know just there on the shelf and just we're really trying to make sure that the quality is the best thing you know the, as best as it can possibly be you know guys i never thought we'd be like looking at shipping and Printing yeah. costs and posting. When, when you started the podcast, did you ever think you'd be doing that? It's a podcast, it's not paper. <laughs> but no, here we are, looking at paper costs, like you say, and looking at VAT and, uh, you know, shipping costs and stuff like that. But it is it is really, really, really exciting. And, you know, fingers crossed, you know, everything goes to plan. Yeah, so we'd love you to get involved and back this on Kickstarter if you can. Now, the book, to summarise it, really, we've picked out 10 of our favourite guests that we've had on the show. And I think a real variety of guests as well that will give you a real good overview, not only of kind of, you know, what we do on the podcast and have something that you can keep forever. Because that's one thing about doing a podcast. 
we upload it onto a server somewhere, it doesn't really exist. You know, it's it can vanish one day. And a book, we hope, will live on in libraries for, like, you know, generations to come. So people can pick this off the shelf and read the stories from people like Nolan Bushnell and Trip Hawkins and Jeff Minter is in the book as well and Dominic Diamond. It really is some of our favourite kind of A-list guests to give you a real variety of the kind of content that we cover on the podcast and have something that you can have on your shelf, have on your coffee table and, you know, be really proud of this history of gaming that we've captured. And also we're doing, like Ravi mentioned, there's going to be, uh, between every interview, there's going to be some unique features and things that we're doing, especially for the book. We're hoping to have some extra exclusive interviews in there for the book as well. Like Joe mentioned, it is live now when this podcast drops. So if you can get on this weekend and back this, we'd hugely appreciate it. Uh, But we've got some amazing perks on there that you can read about on the page. I think my favourite one is we're going to be doing a unique exclusive recording an episode of the retro hour that is going to come out on cassette tape you're you're gonna have to find a cassette player (laughs) (laughs) well yeah that that is going to be a really interesting one and uh but yeah an exclusive episode which will only ever come out on cassette uh for backing that tier but we've also got loads of other things we're going to have t-shirts which people have always asked us about um we're going to have computer case badges there's gonna there's loads of perks on there which are gonna be coming out. You you need to go and check it out and see it all because yeah. of Dan's absolutely worked his butt off the last couple of weeks, getting it all typed up for us and making it all look pretty and fantastic. So look, um, I mean it's out there now. Um like we mentioned, you know, it's a tough time, but if you can go and back this on Kickstarter, honestly, it's gonna be something we're so proud of this and it's gonna be something you'll absolutely love if you enjoy our podcast. So and of course link it up. The Kickstarter link will be the first thing in the show notes this week, and it is out there right now for the next month. Please help us make this happen. The Retro Hour, the history of video gaming from those that make it happen. That'd be a nice little Christmas present for you to back that and treat yourself this year, I think, wouldn't it? So uh, before we get into the news this week, I mean, we have got an amazing guest. That's what we pride ourselves on on this podcast. And actually, this is one of the very rare instances when we've got a part two. Yeah, and what a part two. We've never covered rhythm games on this podcast and you know out of the rhythm games guitar hero is <laughs> absolutely huge one and uh it came from a group called harmonics and it's got really interesting history actually there was like a few titles that i didn't actually know about because because this is the whole thing about this interview we're getting out of our comfort zone you know um joe was the guitar hero pro uh, me, <laughs> me and dad weren't, <laughs> weren't the masters at it but um there was a few titles like Amplitude and uh, Frequency as well that came before mm. Guitar Hero that kind of led to that. And, uh, you know, I had my little period where I was sat in a room thinking I was, you know, a rock star kind of going on Guitar Hero. I was Hero. a rock star, man. Joe, Joe was a real rock star. Yeah. No, when I played but, Guitar Hero, I was a rock star. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, I think this interview is great and it, it's got a real good history about how that title developed. And, you know, stuff like having the guitar, you know, packaged with the actual game and having to convince stores to have this on their shelf and, you know, mm. like all the it's issues that came up with that. Yeah, it's a big ask, isn't it? And I think, because it had not been done before and, uh, you know, retailers were looking at this thinking, you know, th- this is very bizarre and obviously having hardware in the box, quite expensive too, but how they convince the retailers and how it became such a big success. We hear all about that with Mike. And like you mentioned, I mean, you know, you were like our resident kind of guitar hero fan back in the day. I know you're at work and you couldn't make this interview, but you've got fond memories of that game. Oh God, I absolutely loved it. And I came out in 2005. So at the time I was like 15, 16 and I adored it. All my friends got it. And then I got it for Christmas. And you don't really think about like the development of the game and the thought that I'd have to go into the process of that. And learning about like you say like the fact that they had to convince the retailers to for to let it take up that much self shelf space because of mm. you know it wasn't a full size guitar but it was it was a pretty big box you know and i guess it was such a huge gamble at the time and then you know it went on to sell something like 25 million copies across the series well not only that joe they had the um the the music industry so to get the songs the rights to license yeah. the songs they had to convince everyone and everyone in the music industry was kind of like you know shocked with napster and what happened <laughs> we're really like we don't want any involvement at all so that took a while for them to actually yeah yeah get well on the, board because in of the napster. first in the first game the licensing they got it but they had to re-record the music with with their own musicians and stuff like that and it wasn't until the game picked up speed that that 
like you say, that the record labels start to trust the product. So I can imagine, you know, I can't wait to hear the second half. But I can imagine it must have been such a gamble and so grueling, you know, for Mike and the team, you know, to, to work, put all that hard work into it and everything. And just like, is this going to be a hit or not? Um, spoilers, it was a massive hit. Um, but just hearing about that story is going to be so cool. Yeah, and even the fact that, you know, there was a split and Guitar Hero and Rock Band essentially became rivals, yeah. you know, even though they both came from the same camp. It's a really interesting story. So part two of our chat with Mike Dornbrook last week, we covered his uh, Infocom period. This week, uh, we're going into harmonics and Guitar Hero and Rock Band. He'll be on the show in around half an hour from now. But of course, before that, we'd like to bring you up to speed on the big headlines from the world of retro from over the last week. And uh, I think most retro gaming fans would consider the, themselves to know their way around games like Super Mario Brothers pretty well. But it turns out that apparently we could have been playing Mario Brothers wrong for our entire lives. This, I don't want to say it's mind-blowing. I feel like I've heard of this before. Mm. And it's not necessarily new news, but it's blowing up on TikTok. And, you know, I've seen it everywhere this last week. So apparently, like you say, we've been playing the original Super Mario Bros., wrong all these years all the way from the original nes version this works on and every single port of this game apparently works on so you know if you play it on the wii or any of the compilations this hack if you will will work so this has been posted on tiktok and it was posted by retro gaming online and i think it's on about three million views now um <laughs> thousands of comments of people saying they never knew this so it's the original Super Mario Bros. is 32 levels, right, with eight worlds, which is quite big when you when you put it like that, because a lot of games at the time were, you know, we were only really coming out of one screen, <laughs> you yeah. know, by the time Mario Candy came out, Super Mario Bros. So you've got 32 levels, and, you know, there's, there's warp pipes, and there's all secrets that people know in the second level. You can jump over the top of the level, and you can warp to later levels and stuff like that. But if you die on Mario... That's it. The game the game ends if you, lo you lose all your life. So you go right back to the start. There was no save feature. There was no passwords or anything like that. As it turns out, if you die, lose all your lives, you wait for the game to return to the menu screen and you hold down an A and it will take you back to the world you were in. So if what? you were in world, world 5, but you were on the third level of world 5, it takes you to, to, to the start of that world. So if you were on world seven and you died on seven three you press down an a and it will take you back to world seven level one so it kind of like a continue system from the world you were in but not the level you were on which like i say like it, it seems a lot of people didn't know about this i i'm i don't want to be a, like a hipster and be like oh yeah i knew that but like i feel like i might have heard that before but you know at the same time it it does feel new to me <laughs> like what about yeah, you guys I always, I, 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 I always thought it was like start from the beginning yeah, uh, every time, and that was just like the brutal old school way that they did it. I did not know about this at all, and it seems like, um, you know, I I thought some some games have passcodes, don't they? Yeah, yeah, kind of ch checkpoints and stuff. But this does this work on like lots of different versions then, like and yeah, on the it, OG. Yeah, it works on the original NES version, and then it works on like the virtual console versions as well. So what? it works on the Wii, the Wii U, the Switch. Um, I've heard it. I've not tried it myself. I've heard it works on. Uh, some of the other re-releases with the compilations and stuff like on the Wii and stuff like that as well it's just there in the game um, and I guess uh, there, there wasn't any like publication of it in manuals or anything like that I maybe. know it wasn't in the manual apparently at all yeah, yeah. <laughs> so did, did you know this Dan or is this news to you I must, I must admit, I hadn't heard this before, but I'm looking at the uh, the comments on the Lifehacker article that we're putting in our show notes, and everyone's like, oh, this is old news. I knew about that back in the 80s. So I imagine, I mean, from from what I've seen of this, it looks like it was maybe a, a game testing kind of thing left in, you know, for the developers yeah. so they could test the levels and worlds and stuff so, like so, that. So like the Mario pros would have known about it. Like, you know, that would have been playground knowledge, whereas me i'm a mario noob you know i've only picked it a few times i'd, I'd be stuck going all the way from the beginning <laughs> yeah no one no one i knew knew this at the school yeah anything, i, do, I yeah, don't so. i don't remember us doing it or anything like that so and the fact that it wasn't in the manual it just feel like it wasn't something that was picked up uh but interestingly i think it was about a month or two ago i saw it doing the rounds that um the nes version of duck hunt people realizing that that was that was two player and if you just picked up the second controller yeah. you could actually fly the ducks around with the second controller i i, I didn't, didn't realize i didn't know that and that was in the manual apparently i 
I didn't realize Lemmings was two player, and I that was one of my oh. favorite games for years. And I had <laughs> so many opportunities where a friend was around, but I was like, nah, single player, mate. Just <laughs> oh, we, we used to play two player Lemmings all the time, me and my brother. I always give him the crap mouse that came with the Amiga as well, and I, <laughs> the nice, you know, third party one that I bought. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's amazing when people are still discovering new things about games that are like approaching 40 years old now. So, uh, and, and nice to see it blowing up on TikTok. I love the way you delivered that cheat as well, Joe. I'm thinking maybe we need like a, you know, make it like the Games Master or Namrude, you know, have like a Joe's cheat section. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to do that from now on. <laughs> get you a monocle or get, get you to say Scrotty Fertilis or something. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, if you want to read more about that, I'll, I'll link it up in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, uh, I know you're a fan of these uh, <laughs> these old school games, Joe. We actually, on our After Hours podcast that we do for our patrons this month, we're talking about add-ons. And uh, you t- I think you picked the, without giving too many spoilers, the Mega CD was definitely on your list. Um, yeah. And we all know about games like Night Trap and everything like that, you know, the FMV craze back in the mid-90s. But it turns out that Sega were actually working on quite an ambitious FMV game around this time that they actually spent two to three million dollars on that never actually made it to market. And uh, people are describing this as a bit of a, a saucy lost Sega FMV game. I think, and this has been found. I think the name saucy has been overused here to get a kind of clickbaity title here. It's not that yeah, saucy. R- R- Ravi's got, Rav got a much higher expectation of what warrants saucy. Well, than plumbers wear <laughs> ties or something like that. Yeah. You know, um, this is this is the 90s and uh, a, lot of, a lot of stuff was like that. But what I find interesting about this is the kind of concept, you know, um, it's like an FMV title um, and... It's, it's you're kind of based on a planet and um you're exploring mazes collecting crystals so maybe it's like a, a on an island so it's like a saucy crystal maze <laughs> that's, that's what i would have led with as a, as a kind of title so what was the name of the title because this it went through development hell didn't it dan so it's got. Um, it was originally going to be called Rebellion. It was also going to be called um, Amazonia, and then I think they settled on that Sacred Pools as the final name before it got scrapped. So this was like Sega Studio that ended up yeah. doing PC stuff yeah. as well and porting for other titles. Yeah, yeah, and like you say, it was going to be for the Saturn, um, which I don't think had. I mean, as far as I'm aware, it wasn't really known for its FMV titles. Obviously hell of a lot of FMV titles on the Sega CD, like Dan says. Um, so, you know, this was meant to be set for a 1996 release, um, and it's recently been posted online by a website called Gaming Alexandria. Who have well, it secured... had the video card, the Saturn. So yeah, it did. Maybe did, did, that it? would yeah. have helped it a bit. Yeah, like. maybe, maybe, because it, it from the YouTube videos, it does look, I don't want to say better quality, but it looks better than the, C, than the Sega CD you know, the video quality of it. I mean, the acting and the costumes and stuff still look absolutely <laughs> awful. Um, and um, yeah, a, it was, it's been described. So the game's selling point was going to be more a suggestion of erotic and it was never going to be that overly sexual, but apparently there mm. was going to be no nudity, but there was going to be a lot of suggestive like costumes, you know, raunchy and racy costumes in there. Um, I've been watching the I've been watching the gameplay of it, and as as you say, Ravi, you kind of like point and click collecting crystals, but then there is some really awful fighting mechanics in it as well. From like <laughs> yeah. a first person, well, point I, of I'm view. surprised by the budget as well because it's like two to three million um, that they that they spent on this. Obviously, they had to pay actors and do all the film, yeah, and yeah. Like have a proper film set for this as well. So for it to not actually come out in the end is. Uh, it's quite surprising, and and there's there's been a leak. Basically, this is this has came from uh, a, a Sega developer, okay, a Sega Soft employee that actually has provided alpha builds of the game. So, oh wow, the alpha builds were for the Saturn, PC, and also the PlayStation as well. So I can mm. imagine this is kind of going to get like spread online, maybe fixed up a bit, kind of recompiled, and this will be one that gets put into the collection. You know, we might see a remaster in the future or something. I don't think <laughs> Sega's that bothered about this kind of property. Um, Bring it to the Sega you know. Saturn Mini. <laughs> <laughs> the launch title. <laughs> launch title for the Sega Saturn Mini, yeah. We saw last week that, you know, they were asking, Sega were actually putting it out there, asking their fans which mini console they want them to develop next. Kind of turns out maybe the Dreamcast was a favourite, but if they did do Saturn Mini, I mean, they have got a bit of a 
a reputation for kind of putting unreleased games on these mini consoles. Yeah. So that, that would be like, it'd be an interesting choice. You know, there's, the, there's uh, a real <laughs> like <laughs> group of fans for the cheesier the um, FMV, the better, you yeah. know, and they're all into collecting it and stuff. And I think to a degree, that's why stuff like, you know, Night Trap's gone onto limited run games. And also this is probably an attempt at a follow on of, of Night Trap with a bit of a sauciness and that kind of style, you know, that, that ended up selling the game and, uh, a bit of controversy yeah I, I i think it's interesting like i wonder how many of these weird fmv titles are out there that have just been filmed and you know actors are like oh i starred in this thing in the 90s <laughs> i've not seen anything about it and then it you know emerges on youtube or something years later I count myself in the fans of crappy FMV games. You know, I I, I must admit it's a bit of <laughs> you a guilty pleasure. You own a CDI, of course. Sure. I do, yeah, exactly, yeah. So it's uh, you know, playing <laughs> Hulk Hogan's Tropical Thunder on there of a weekend. Oh, classic! Bit of a guilty pleasure. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, I would. I'm looking at this, and I don't know if I'm the only one. You know, in our group that thinks actually, I'd really like to play this. It looks all right. It looks quite fun. Yeah, I like. Um, you know, I like Mist. <laughs> I like Mist as well, and all the kind of puzzle solving on that and stuff. And the idea of this kind of crystal mazy puzzle solving thing actually is like, yeah, I could do that. A bit of nineties uh, puzzle solving. Yeah, so if you want to check out the uh, the build so far, and I'll put the uh, six-minute video, you can kind of check out a bit of the gameplay as well. I'll link all that up in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, this is something that um, I must admit I don't spend too much time playing around with, and uh, someone's actually turned this into a full game based around Resident Evil 4's inventory screen. I love this. <laughs> I absolutely love this. So this is due out today as well, November 11th, um, for Xbox, PlayStation, Switch. This is a game called Save Room, which is, like you say, it is based on the Resident Evil 4 inventory screen so i don't know i mean obviously i'm a massive resident evil fan um even to a point where people in our discord chat and on our facebook and stuff like that uh, even take the mick out of me and joke about how many times i've bought resident evil 4 <laughs> over the years on the consoles and stuff but i don't know if you guys have played it but the the uh the inventory the inventory screen um in resident evil 4 you don't have the classic like k uh treasure chests that you can put your your items in you have to keep everything on you in Resident Evil 4 so you mm. can't like put a gun down and pick it up later or anything like that once once you have it you, you there is a shop so you can sell stuff and buy guns and stuff like that you have to take everything with you and uh essentially it's kind of like in the Resident Evil kind of uh what's the word I'm looking for fan base um it's it's renowned that it's it's quite fun or quite funny to arrange your items and such, you know, to make it look really neat, make it look perfect. Like see it in the forum still to this day, people saying, check out, you know, what I've done with my inventory. Look how good it looks with my guns and stuff like that. And essentially so we're in like a grid, aren't they? Yeah. It's like a grid. Like you say, it's like, um, yeah, it's like it's Feng Shui for resident evil or, or, or Tetris with guns. Yeah. <laughs> Tetris with guns, essentially. Yeah. It is a little bit like that from a top down perspective. Um, and yeah, these developers have made, an entire game uh, based out of that, which is only going to be five pounds or five dollars, which I think is really cool. Um, and it's not a physical game or anything like that. It's just a you know a downloadable game. But essentially, the, the entire game concept is around you get given you know your space on the left hand side, and it's not just a square like it is in Resident Evil. It's you know they're all different funky shapes, and then you get given items on the right hand side, and the level is essentially make it fit. But what they've incorporated in there as well, which is pretty cool, is all like the combining items and stuff, which is also in the Resident Evil games. So combining the healing herbs, putting your ammo in guns, combining grenades to make other grenades and stuff like that is all um, in there, which is really cool. I'm just seeing as a huge sardine in there, which is interesting. But um, <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, I you, thinking... you, can, you can get fish in <laughs> Resident Evil 4 <laughs> as a healing item. So like, was it, am I right in Resident Evil 2? I think I remember the inventory. You, were, you you had a choice of like certain things that you could have in there, and you had to leave certain stuff out. You, yes, you know, yes. You, you kind of customized your your character. With yeah, so which weapons you prefer? Yeah, so prior to Resident Evil Four, you just had like six or eight, depending what character you played as, like item slots. And you know, as the games kind of went on, every weapon only took up one slot, and every item, every key took up one slot, but as the games kind of continued, they kind of started to broaden that. So like a particular gun might take up two slots, but by the time okay. they got to Resident Evil 4, 
which isn't the fourth game. It's the fourth game in the main series, but it, you know, there was loads of different offshoots of Resident Evil, even at that point in 2005. And essentially by the time they got there, they just, you know, Resident Evil 4 was just everything stays on you and you've got to make it fit um, in this grid of like 50 squares and you could upgrade it as you, as you progressed in the game. You could get a bigger and bigger grid to put your stuff in. Um, and essentially, like I say, they've, they've made a game out of that concept and um, it looks quite therapeutic. Like, I really want to play this. Um, it reminds I, I think me. the opposite. Yeah, I, I think it will be stressful for me. You know, having mild <laughs> OCD sometimes. I think I'd just have to spend hours you on it. You know what it know. reminds me of? It's like, you know, memory card saves. Yeah. When you, you used to have that, I can see that. that kind of yeah. grid, it's got a similar look to it. This, this is the kind of game I think I'd show my wife and she'd just like, look at it, gone out. And then I'd find her in the middle of the night playing it downstairs in the dark. It's the new uh, Candy Crush. It's the new Candy Crush. It could be. Um, or your power wash game yeah yeah um, so it doesn't seem that it is part of like Resident Evil it seems to be inspired by Resident Evil but you know it, all of it is very 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 similar um, even down to the merchant who's the shop in Resident Evil 4 has a particular voice he, um, like a, an accent which I'm not going to try and do um, which, is quite, which is quite famous and um, they, they have somebody kind of ripping that off in the game as well who talks to you and stuff um, so I'm surprised you know they've got away with that but you know I, I guess it's a parody of the license I guess um, and it's probably only a small development team that have done this but it, it does look pretty cool it is a thing that people are actually making games around inventory yeah. screens now so uh <laughs> An affordable game, which I think it might still be slightly overpriced. But, you know, I'm sure people enjoy it. So. <laughs> Five pounds. <laughs> <laughs> that is that now if you want to check it out. Now, this one looks really cool, actually. Now, this is a new game called Chop Goblins. Now, they're calling this a bite-sized FPS game. It's from the uh, creator of Dusk that we talked about oh, on the yeah. show, um, when that came out. And this one is apparently inspired by the uh, classic movie Gremlins. Is, is that one of your favourites, Dan? I, I must admit, it is. Um, it's always on my Christmas movies list to watch, and a lot, lot, lot of people don't regard Gremlins as a Christmas movie, but it definitely is. Just so oh yeah, so it's, it's, it's for me. <laughs> this sounds like interesting. They're calling it a micro shooter, so it's a game that you can play for less than an hour, and you can just Perfect. like go through it and uh, obviously replay it and do it at, at different times. Looking at the graphics, you know what it really reminds me of: um, Serious Sam. Yeah, if you, if if you ever played that one, it's like a you, mix between Exhumed and uh, Serious it, Sam. It looks like to me Exhumed, Serious Sam, and a little bit of Half Life. Like, yeah, kind, yeah, yeah, kind of. Um, it's that like kind of s- weird zoom perspective where it's like, uh, you know, the perspectives. Yeah, it, it's just weird. The angles look well, Serious Sam to me. Yeah, yeah, I can see that, but. Is the concept of the game then? So correct me if I'm wrong. Is the idea is it is it's meant to be like a classic FPS, but you can sit down and complete it in one sitting. Like it's a bite-sized game, like back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Which, you, you know, people like me, where you know, only get like an hour a week to game these days. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah. You, you've got journey. five levels in there. They're in different time periods. Uh, yeah, five unique weapons as well. Uh, different enemies. There's like leaderboards online as well. And uh, lots of secrets in there as well. So it, do- it does look interesting. Uh, densely packed. Uh, all killer, no filler, apparently. So, nice. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, it looks decent, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's planning to come out on the uh, 2nd of January 2023. Yeah, so that's available to a wish list on Steam now. And I think, you know, it is good to have something to look forward to in that era as well, just after Christmas and New Year, you know, if it's maybe a couple of days before you go back to work, that'll be a nice little filler for that time period, I think. So um, you can wish list that at the moment on their website. So I'll, I'll link that up in our show notes. And all the rest of the stories, you'll find them at the retrohour.com. Now we're going to get the story of Guitar Hero and Rock Band with this week's special guest, part two of our chat with Mike Dornbrook in just a minute. Before we do that, though, let's give a big thank you and a massive mention to a new sponsor. Let's welcome on our friends from AdBot. Now, I don't know about you guys, but um, I I do this in my day job, and I know you do as well, Ravi. Um, I spend a lot of time kind of, you work with, on you know website design, you try and get SEO out there and get your website in front of people, which is always a challenge. I mean, there's that many websites out there. And recently, I've been messing around trying to set up, you know, Google advertising for one company that I'm working with. And I don't know if you've ever used 
Google Ads before, but my God, they make it so complicated. I've, I've not used them before. And uh, my name's Ravi Abbott, not uh, Ravi Abbott, but this <laughs> this looks like it's... You, you can maybe rename yourself as a you know, part of this. Yeah, maybe I should. Yeah. Like, you know, this looks like a really good service, actually, because, you know, Google Ads can be pretty complex. And if, you, if you're like a, a small micro uh, or medium sized business, you can kind of don't really have the time to figure all of that out, you know, and and Google, they are the biggest advertisers, you know, the majority of their income comes from like advertising and, you know, 92% of the global search engine market is Google. Yeah. So if you want to get your product, your website, your business in front of people, it is where you need to be. Now, what I think is really cool about AdBot is, I mean, they actually automate your Google ads and it'll take you under 10 minutes to set it up. So really it's a bit like, you know, having Google ads, but on autopilot. So you'll spend less than half an hour a week ranking searches and it's actually all powered by AI. So rather than you sitting there trying to figure out all these formulas and key, you know, all that stuff that like all Google products, you know, you can spend literally days on this stuff yourself. It will save you on average, I reckon around 75 hours a month. So you spend less than 30 minutes a week doing this. So easy to use as well. I've been playing around with this. And I've got to say, you know, you can do stuff in here that only experts could do in Google Ads. So it's, you know, digital marketing, even advertising. Your grandma could use this. And it works 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it is 100% more effective than you doing it or someone doing it for you. Now, AdBot are also a trusted Google certified partner and that you can outsource your Google Ads to a bot rather than paying for expensive agencies. So if you've got a micro, small or medium sized business, you need to get involved in this today. Now, we've got an incredible offer, like we always do, a great offer for our listeners exclusively of the Retro Hour podcast. So we'll give you three months of AdBot. So that means no platform service fee. All you pay for is the cost of your Google ads. And obviously you can decide how much you want to spend there. And um, this is a promo that applies to their $9 plan. So you can get onto their website right now, myadbot.com and use our exclusive promo code just for Retro Hour listeners. That is retro at checkout and you will get three months with no fee and improve your advertising and get your business in front of new people today. And a big thank you to our friends at AdBot for their support of our show. I think this is such a good idea. I use bots on my Discord. I use bots for everything. I've been using bots since MIRC. So uh, yeah, this is fantastic. (laughs) Yeah, so check them out. Thank you very much to AdBot. So just a quick reminder that the Retro Hour book is now live on Kickstarter. Um, I must admit, a bit of a, probably the most nervous start to a weekend we've ever had. Uh, but it's a nervous excitement, isn't it? I know it's just so incredible that it's out there finally, and we really, really hope you love it. We're sure that you will. So if you want to uh, back that on Kickstarter, you've only got a month to um, to get this funded, and hopefully we'll get it out there for you as soon as possible. And uh, check out all the goals and everything as well. You'll find that uh, in our show notes if you'd like to support the Retro Hour the history of video gaming from those that made it happen. Please make it happen. Right, next, we're going to talk to this week's special guest and get part two of our amazing interview with Mike Dornbrook going inside the history of Guitar Hero and Rock Band next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time for the main event then when we welcome on our special guest and this week we are so pleased to be able to continue the story that we started in last week's podcast because our guest, Mike Dornbrook, his story is so good. We didn't want to chop any of it out and of course last week we went really in depth into the Infocom days and there is lots more to talk about as well including a few games that you might have heard of like Guitar Hero for example and Rock Band. So we'll get into all that and his time at Harmonic Let's welcome back Mike Dornbrook. How you doing, Mike? I'm doing great. Thanks again for uh, coming back to share more of your story with us. We really appreciate it. I'm very happy to uh, to be interviewed by such erudite uh, Englishmen. <laughs> well, that's very kind. Now, uh, let's kind of jump forward then to kind of, you know, where we left off last week. So, you know, skipping forward a few years. I mean, you joined Harmonix Music Systems in 1997. So how did your journey take you there? And why did you want to join that company? Well, I think I mentioned in last week's episode that uh, Bafo had uh, several uh, publishers go under on us. Uh, the third yeah. was one too many. And so I ended up taking a gig uh, for a few months at uh, Looking Glass, who were famous for things like System Shock and various other kind of firsts in video gaming. And uh, they 
uh, offered to make me a VP of marketing there, but I had some doubts about the future of the company. They had just been purchased by uh, someone who was not in the games industry. He'd actually run a television station in New York, decided he wanted to get into games, looked around for a company to buy, thought they were all too expensive. So instead he bought a government COBOL programming group of 700 mostly guys who were like in their 50s who were writing things for like social security and he was going to mm. repurpose them into doing games because he thought that would be way cheaper than trying to buy a game studio well <laughs> that didn't work out so well as you can imagine and so he bought looking glass as a way of supercharging his other idea which is get the looking glass team of like 70 to train these like 700 guys to be game developers well i was pretty sure that wasn't going to work uh, i didn't think the future of the company was looking rosy at the same time i got contacted by a headhunter and I ended up interviewing at harmonics and even though harmonics was only about 15 people at the time meeting them especially meeting alex and ron alex Rogopoulos and ron agozi the two founders I was pretty blown away i mean they were obviously brilliant off the charts. They were both MIT grads. They'd both been at the MIT Media Lab. And they were the kinds of guys who at MIT are viewed as brilliant. You know, I was impressed with them, but more I was impressed with their vision. I mean, they were absolutely convinced that music would become interactive. And having gone through the whole thing with Infocom, you know, I thought, you know, I think they're probably right. I think it will. The question is when? Is it two years or 20 years. But I thought these were the guys who could make it happen if anyone could. And if I could just help them extend that runway, maybe we could make it work. And so though all my friends told me I was nuts not to take the looking glass job, since that was an established, well-respected company with a, you know, significant, uh, you know, team of 70 people, I took the risk and went with harmonics and boy, am I glad I did. I was I was wondering, you know, they talked about music kind of um, uh, becoming a, a standard for the company. Did they have a history of like playing with some rhythm games and stuff? I know there was a dance aerobics for the NAS, which seemed to be a, a really early title. And then there was also a Prapper the Rapper, which came out. Um, we definitely knew about Parappa the Rapper, and I can't remember exactly. Do you remember when that came out? 96, I've got to say. Do you think 96, 97? Okay, it was already out when I joined. I, I, mean, I knew we actually met with, um, and I'm blanking on his name, the guy who created that a number of times. Um, and we definitely had a high regard for what he had done. And definitely music games had, or you know, music arcade games, even like Dance Dance Revolution had done well in Japan or in Asia. Uh, also, um, Guitar Freaks. Konami had done a game... Uh, called Guitar Freaks that had done quite well over there. They had brought it to the U.S. and in arcades, and it failed here. And I'll get into more of that later because there's a story around that with uh, Guitar Hero. But um, we were looking at what was going on in Japan and Asia. Before I got there, they had created a basically a music creativity tool called the Axe. That was pretty much directly out of their thesis uh, at the Media Lab, it's essentially a gestural control of melody. And it was really quite cool. I mean, it was, you know, it worked really well. It was very engaging. Um, and they were about to launch it. And they'd been looking for a marketing and sales guy for a couple of years. So when I got hired, they were pretty much ready to launch and said, okay, let's launch this. And I, you know, I liked it, but I was a little worried that it was maybe not ready for prime time, ready for the marketplace. And, I, you know, the plan was to basically bet all of the company's money on this launch. And my fear was if it failed, it was going to kill the company. And so I strongly suggested that we do a series of focus tests first, just to make sure that what we had was going to fly. And generally, focus tests are more positive than the real world they tend to try to tell you what you want to hear but these focus tests uh basically told us something that we didn't want to hear but i'm glad we did them they basically said this is really cool 
but I have no idea what I'd do with it after 15 minutes. And I say, well, okay, that's the kiss of death. If we try to sell this for, you know, 39, 49, 95, and somebody gets 15 minutes out of it, they're either going to be returning it or bad mouthing it or both. And so, you know, we'll just be blowing all the money we have on this launch. So let's not do it. And I have to say, I was super impressed that these two young guys, they were 17 and 19 years younger than me. So I was jokingly called the uh, adult supervision, took my advice and went back to their investors and said, hey, you know, we've done some research and we thought about this and we've decided we're not going to launch this right now. We're going to pivot and do something a little different. And so what we decided to do was a couple things. One, there was one guy that I had been really impressed with at Looking Glass, Greg LaPiccolo. He was running the Thief team and everyone there thought he was just a fantastic project manager for a game. He was also a musician. So they had originally hired him as audio director. But before that, for I think something like 10 years, he'd been in a band called Tribe. He was the bassist and songwriter. And, and he'd toured all over the world. So he knew music inside out. He knew video games. And he knew how to manage a team well. And I said, we ought to get him in and look for ways to make what we've done with the acts something that is a step-by-step sense of what do you do next? What's the next goal? What's the next, you know, challenge? Essentially, turn it into a game. And the other thing we looked at doing was, well, there were two other things, actually. One was, where would something that's a 15-minute experience be a plus? And we thought, theme parks. So we went to Disney uh, Imagineering and said, hey, take a look at this. And they actually signed us up. We did a uh, project for Epcot in Florida. And as far as I know, I mean, when that opened, I think, 99, I know it was still running like, you know, 12, 15 years later. I'm not sure if it still is now, but I know when we, when we sold it, one of the things they required was that we provide several backups for every piece of equipment, including multiple computers that could run Windows 95 in case you know, the computer broke down and they needed to replace it. They wanted to be able to keep the same technology in place. And they said, look, you know, it's a small world after all has been running for 50 years. You know, you never know. So we were totally shocked that, you know, what we were putting in might last for even a few years, you know, much less decades. But as far as I know, it did last decades. The other thing we did was go after Japan in a big way and karaoke. Uh, karaoke had been growing dramatically. It was a multi-billion dollar industry and it was starting to plateau. And Alex thought that adding the ability to play a melody, an instrument along with the singer would extend karaoke. It would allow more people in the room to be doing something to contribute to the song. And so he spent the better part of the next 18 months in Japan, uh, probably, I don't know, maybe not quite half the time, but a lot of time over there, uh, pitching the various companies. We got a lot of interest, but because the industry started to tank and they started having to cut back and lay people off, they got super, I mean, they're already pretty conservative, but they got super conservative and they just weren't able to pull the trigger on doing something new. In the meantime, we had created um, a demo uh, of what we were calling Freak, uh, which you know eventually got changed to Frequency, but um, that got pitched around. I mean, I, Greg and I went to any number of game publishers, you know, Sony and Microsoft and Electronic Arts, etc. Um, and Alex, uh, had, having already given up on karaoke in Japan, went after the music oriented dot coms. This was just before the dot com meltdown. And some of them had raised hundreds of millions of dollars, but had actually nothing to show for it. So he was out showing them, hey, you could have this on your website, just as dot com happened and crashed. So that thread dried up. But fortunately, Sony decided they wanted to work with us uh, to get freak frequency, freak we preferred Freak pretty strongly, and we had Freak.com and everything already signed up. 
but their lawyers were a little nervous about the fact that someone had trademarked Freak many years earlier and abandoned it many years earlier. And, you know, all our lawyers said, like, look, if they've abandoned it, haven't used it in like seven years, there's absolutely no problem. But Sony's lawyers were ultra conservative and said, nope, got to change the name. So that's how it ended up being called Frequency. It, it was a really interesting title, like the look of Frequency. I, I'd say it wasn't as much like Guitar Hero. It was more kind of like Tempest or Wipeout kind of mixed mixed together. Uh, wh- where did the kind of concept of that come from? You know, I don't know that I can answer that intelligently. Um our art director, Ryan Lesser, and his crew, and to probably a pretty great extent, Alex Rogopoulos had a pretty good eye for user interface, and I'm sure was pretty heavily involved in pushing, you know, whatever look ended up, you know, coming out. But um, I don't know that I could tell you exactly how that look came about. I can tell you that the reason the music came out the way it did, that was not at all what we planned. We planned to license you know, popular music. No one would license us music. Uh, It was really, really difficult. Napster had just happened. And the entire music industry was really nervous about anything computer or internet related. Since these, you know, this game was actually going to be able to be played, you know, machine to machine over the network. Uh, Just the fact that that was even mentioned made them nervous. And so we couldn't license virtually anything that we were interested in. We had to go with pretty obscure stuff. We ended up with a fair amount of tech now, and we wrote a lot of the songs internally, um, which had some advantages because the guys writing them could create them with the game in mind, you know, in, in terms of making, uh, making it easy to get into some of them versus, you know, having them become harder and harder and, you know, just the pacing of the game could be designed into the song. Um, but that's why we ended up with the kind of offbeat techno oriented music we, we did in, in that game. Well, even though harmonics were, you know, mainly known for obviously the music games, they did stray into non music games briefly as well. I mean, most notably iToy anti-grav you know for the ps2 i toy what was kind of the, the deal there then and wh- why did they kind of veer off course for that well that's another interesting story so um uh kai uh what's his name oh i'm blanking on his name the vp of uh product development for sony loved us and was you know big backer for frequency frequency did not do anywhere near as well as sony expected they were expecting to sell a couple million copies and it didn't even sell 200,000. So it was like less than 10% of what they expected. I did manage to pull a fast one. Um, I'll tell you another really quick side story first, which is our contract. I don't know if you know how the industry finances things typically, but it's usually an advance against royalties, just like music or books or whatever. So the publisher gives you the money to create the game. And that is an advance. And then you don't get a dime out of, of royalty until all the advances have been recouped at your royalty rate. So if you're getting a 10% royalty, they have to, and you've got 2 million advance, they have to sell $20 million before you've recouped the 2 million. So they can make a ton of money before you get a dime of any sort of profit. So we had built into the contract that if they did launch it outside the U.S., That would be pure royalty to us, not going against the advance. And I think they thought that there was no chance of that unless it was a super, super hit. But I nominated it for a BAFTA. And actually, I think I nominated it for three different BAFTAs. But we didn't even have the money and the time to actually go to London to the ceremony. So I asked the VP of Sony for Europe to pick up the award if we won. We won. He had to go up on stage and pick up a a BAFTA, and he'd never been able to do that before. And so now he's in a position where his game has won a BAFTA, and how can he not launch it in Europe? Well, he did. And so we did actually make some royalties off the European sales. Anyway, we were in really good stead with Sony in terms of getting the product done 
well, on time, on budget. And they felt that they had screwed up on their end. So they said, let's let you do a follow on game amplitude. And, you know, let's make a few tweaks to it. But this time around, you know, we're going to make this go. Well, what we didn't understand is that Sony internally didn't run any of this past sales and marketing. Apparently they were so siloed that the, the, you know, producer end of Sony could make a decision. And then when the game is done, just throw it at sales and marketing. So when the game was done, they threw it at sales and marketing. And those guys all said, what? Another one? The last one bombed and they didn't get behind it at all. So the VP at Sony who, you know, talked us into this was feeling kind of like he owed us something. He still really liked us. He wanted us to succeed. But he said, look, if I have you do another music game, I'll be fired. We have this new device that's coming out, this uh, camera, and you guys are smart. Can you find an interesting way of using the camera in a game? So he, you know, we went off and came up with the idea for Antigrav and uh, pitched it to them. And they liked it. They funded it. And actually, <laughs> until Guitar Hero, it was our best-selling game by far. I mean, it sold about a half million right. copies. So uh, kind of a weird side story there that, you know, until Guitar Hero, and that was our ninth game, uh, the one non-music game was the one that sold by far the best. So uh, you mentioned that Amplitude as well. They they had like some actual serious titles and, uh, you know, bands coming on board. Was that because Sony like trusted you guys more and managed to get some deals with the record labels? I think partly it was we were getting a little further away from the Napster fiasco. I think it was also, yes, I think a little bit more money that could be thrown at licensing. But honestly, it's far enough back in time that I don't recall all the details. Yeah, I, I remember there were like Run DMC and garbage and stuff. And like later on, uh, Run DMC were actually on SSX Tricky and stuff like that. So uh, there might have been some kind of certain deals going on with uh, Run DMC's label back then. So let's get into Guitar Hero then. Kind of give us the the background from, from your memory then. What was the original goals of that game and where did the idea kind of come from? Did it kind of spawn out of these earlier titles? So after doing those three, well, I think even while we were working on iToy Antigrav, we started working with Konami and they asked us if we could do a uh, karaoke revolution, which I think they had done in Asia, but they wanted us to do all, you know, a Western version of it. So we created karaoke revolution for them. And then, you know, they, we did, I think four follow on karaoke, karaoke games with them, but that gets a little boring and tedious to keep kind of doing the same thing. And they weren't ever really doing a ton of marketing. So we never really got a royalty check from them and we were getting advances, but not, uh, you know, they were not pushing these games in a big way. They were, you know, they were recouping all of their money and probably making some profit, but you know, they certainly wouldn't have had to do five of them unless they were making money, but we weren't really making money. And we knew that they had done guitar freaks. And it had done very well in Asia. And so we went to, the, you know, we knew the U.S. guys pretty well by this point. We had worked with them for a couple of years. We said, guys, we have a concept for a guitar game. And we literally had already mocked up the cover of the box. We had the logo, uh, Guitar Hero. I purchased the GuitarHero.com URL. So we went to them and said, here's an idea. You guys did guitar freaks it was a great game but you blew it in the u.s by bringing it over with japanese music we want to recreate that with american rock and roll and the american konami guys were completely on board they're like this is a great idea they wanted to go ahead and do it but they had to run everything past tokyo and tokyo nixed it said nope already tried that doesn't work in the in the u.s and the Konami US guys were just, no, 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 you don't understand, but they got nowhere. So about, I don't know, seven, eight, nine months later, out of the blue, I get a call from Kai Huang, who was the president and co-founder of Red Octane. And Red Octane's biggest product, and it was doing quite well and, and making them a fair amount of money, 
was the dance pad for Dance Dance Revolution. They, uh, the one that came in the box from Konami wore out fairly quickly and they were a small maker of peripheral devices for video games. So like a steering wheel for a driving game, that kind of thing. And so they decided they could design and build a better dance mat. They did. They charged a premium price for it. It sold like crazy and they were making a fair amount of money. So they got in touch with us. And even though they were a smaller company, I think at the time they had 28 people and we had 35. This was fall, winter, sort of late 04. Yeah, 2004. And Mm -hmm. Kai calls me and says, you know, we think there's more demand out there for music games than the U.S. publishers seem to realize. And we think doing a guitar game would be a good idea if we could create a guitar could you create a guitar game and i laughed and said not only could we but we already have the concept the logo the url you know we're halfway down the pike already and our engine that we've used to create frequency amplitude these karaoke games or whatever is kind of perfectly tuned now i mean we could do it faster and for less money than anyone else on the planet and so we made a deal and because they were had never launched a game and we're a fairly small company, you know, I said, look, we're taking a risk working with you, obviously. And, you know, you don't have a lot of resources and you've never done this before. So this is going to be more like a real partnership. You know, you've got to treat us more like not a standard publishing deal. I mean, we're going to, if you, if this does really, really well, we're going to get like half the upside. And so the deal was fairly strongly uh, compared to most publishing deals that are signed by you know, a, a game studio, pretty strongly, not so I shouldn't say completely in our favor, but it was much more even than most. You know, the game when it came out, well, you know, I'll let you ask some more questions that you can, we can uh, maybe get to that in a moment. Sorry, well, I could go on too long. You should probably edit this part out. <laughs> oh, no, it's great. Um, I, I was just wondering, like, I, I was exactly going to ask about the interface with the, you know, the strum uh, bar and the whammy bar as well. W- was that kind of massively focus tested? And um, did you have any kind of prototypes or any other concepts that were going to be used? No, as I recall, the guitar design was really strongly driven by our game designers at, at Harmonix. They really wanted to have that whammy bar, which I know Red Octane was questioning. They were like, no, 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 we've got to have it. They were very, you know, they pretty much designed what the interface on the guitar was going to be like. I mean, one of the things we did run into with the um, strumming in the, the very first guitars that actually came out of China, we ended up having a problem and maybe I should go into that later. Oh, I was also wondering, like, you know, they had the dance mats and that was probably quite easy to package and, uh, you know, put on retailers' shelves. Um, have it, having the guitar was quite a huge device to actually have there. Did you think there'd be any resistance from uh, retailers to have this kind of packaged? Yes. And that was a big, big part of the story. So that box took up the position of maybe 50 regular game boxes. And so when it first got shown to retail, which I think was at the industry E3 show in June of 05, they all resisted. I mean, no one would take it. And in the meantime, we had done a deal with Viacom. This was before we sold to Viacom, but... We had done a deal with them to support marketing of some future game that we did. And in return, they would get a percentage of our revenue stream from that game. And they, they were kind of just getting their foot in the water to deal, you know, to do something with us. And so it was, there was nothing defined when we set that deal up, but we went back to them and said, Hey, we're having a ton of trouble. You know, Red Octane can't really get any retailers to carry this. Is there anything you can do to help? So we got them on our side and they managed to talk Best Buy into trying it out. And so Kai and his brother 
mortgaged their houses in order to buy the first inventory of guitars. Wow. <laughs> 100,000 guitar. And no, they took a massive risk. And they were both married. I think they might have both had kids. Um, so they were like betting everything on this. They ordered 100,000 guitars from China. And I think Best Buy had taken 8,000. And so one of the things that I did, which actually broke the contract, <laughs> the contract it typically uh, publishers do not allow game developers to have any involvement in marketing except, you know, under their uh, purview. You know, they might get you involved with some press interviews or whatever, but in general, you, you, you say in the contract that all marketing is in the in complete control of the publisher and, you know, we will not do anything uh, wow. without your permission. Well, I decided to ask for forgiveness rather than permission on this, but one of the things that I had been doing for years is responding to all of the emails that came in from fans. I always yeah. felt that companies who didn't do that, who just ignored incoming, you know, emails were making a mistake. And so I would spend extra time. I'd stay late if I had to and respond to folks. And so, I mean, you know, there were a number of people, you know, maybe 50 or so over time that I'd kind of developed and, you know, a relationship back and forth with. And they were very, very clearly hoping we would do something more on the lines of frequency amplitude again and not these karaoke games. And so as Guitar Hero was shipping, I got in touch with them and said, okay, we've come out with something I think you're going to really like and you could really do something to help. There's not going to be much marketing. There's not, Red Octane had virtually no marketing budget and, you know, they couldn't afford to set up demo stations in stores or anything like that. I said, call, find out like a local Best Buy, go there, ask the staff to open a box of Guitar Hero and set it up and start playing it and try to get the staff excited about it. And mm. then come back here and report what worked and what didn't. And a bunch of them did it. And you know, some of them said, look, I played for three hours. I had a whole crowd of people gather around me, <laughs> you know, and wow, it was so much fun. And then we heard through Best Buy that the store manager network started spreading this news and store managers saying, it's amazing. You open the box and let someone play it and it just grows a crowd and it starts selling like crazy. And so the stores that had opened a box were selling something like 50 times as many as the ones that weren't. So they've it very quickly spread, hey, do this, right? Well, do you know how much money it would cost to set up a demo station at each Best Buy? They'd be millions of dollars. And there's no way that Red Octane could have afforded that. So we basically got this free demo set up uh, basically by, uh, you know, my pushing people to go off and, you know, I kind of broke the contract, but um, we got them to, uh, to help us. And so about a week after it went on sale at Best Buy, they called back and said, how many more do you have? And Red Octane said like 92,000. And they said, we'll take them all. And so, Amazing. <laughs> what? I mean, I think there was one other retailer that got some, but uh, Best Buy got almost all of them. And then, of course, as it started taking off, as people were buying it and having these parties at their homes, and then everybody who came to the party was going up and buying it, I mean, it was spreading virally, which, by the way, was not something we expected. Though. Even supporting that type of play wasn't added to the last minute. We thought it was going to be a sole experience or that if people were playing with others, it would be by a online connection, not and not a group play at someone's house. But that ended up being what, what uh, drove it, is people were having parties. And all of the other retailers started calling Red Octane and saying, okay, we want it. And Red Octane, and they were saying, so when can we get it? Uh, this, by the way, this is the beginning of November, right? It's before Black Friday, before Thanksgiving, before the big shopping time in America. And Red Octane said, well, our, our next shipment comes in in February. And they were like, what? And they were like, well, we've been begging you for a month to take it. And I'm sorry, but that's when we can get the next batch. Yet. So, you know, they were able to order another quarter million to come in in February, but there were no more for that Christmas other than that original 100,000. 
I remember, yeah, the hype around it on, you know, forums and stuff back then, people, you know, lining up to get one and, you know, setting up like, you know, stock checkers and that kind of thing just to get hold of it. There was definitely a, you know, what we call today kind of a viral hype around it, wasn't there? Yeah, we were really surprised at Harmonix. I mean, we um, were not confident, especially given that there was virtually no marketing budget, that it was going to do very well. We also weren't sure that we weren't seeing a flash in the pan, that maybe this was just a, you know, initial surge and then it would peter out. And so, uh, you know, after, I think it was January, February, Electronic Arts came to talk to us and they were looking at kind of doing some deal with us. And they said, you know, based on what we saw, if we had had that game, we could have sold 2 million copies in uh, November, December. We thought they were crazy. We thought there was no way, you know, because, you know, it was kind of expensive and bulky and, you know, everything. So, uh, you know, it turns out, obviously, we learned in retrospect they were completely correct, but it took a while. I mean, the even through the spring, I mean, that quarter million that came in in February sold out fairly quickly. But given the long lead times on ordering more, I think it was in May before they got another batch. And by then, they were talking to Activision about being acquired by Activision. And we got wind of that Activision plays hardball. They are very difficult to deal with. They tend to be very litigious. They very often will break contracts and say, hey, sue us. We've got deep pockets. You'll never be able to survive the cost of suing us. You know, they'll, they'll say that to your face. And um, we didn't want to be in the position where suddenly our contracts with Red Octane were all owned by Activision and the only way we were going to be able to collect on them was by, you know, spending a lot on lawyers. So we pretty much concluded we also were going to have to sell and we needed to sell to somebody who could, who could fight Activision if necessary. Um, and it became necessary. It was um, quite a steep learning curve. I, I, I do remember kind of picking it up and, you know, it, it would like suddenly click at a certain point and you go, ah, oh, yes, that's how it works. How important were like tutorials and, uh, you know, setting up the kind of player to be able to use this new interface? Yeah, that is something I think we learned the hard way from frequency and amplitude. One of the things that we think stopped frequency from succeeding was how difficult it was for someone watching someone else playing to figure out what in the world was going on. Um, it had a kind of a steep learning curve and I'll, I'll tell you another quick story about frequency, just to kind of make this point when, uh, when, when we got to a point where we had a, you know, fairly well working, uh, version of frequency, Sony did a whole bunch of focus testing and they start off by showing folks like a one page summary of the game and said, what do you think of this? And apparently they had an incredibly low interest rate. It was something like 8% said, yeah, I'd be interested in this. And then they had them play it for like half an hour. And after the play session, they said, you know, how interested are you? And it had gone up into the 90s. I mean, people had gone from like 8% interested to 90 something percent interested. So he said they'd never seen anything like it. And that's what convinced them that they had a hit. But what we learned the hard way was the way to get someone interested was essentially almost force them to play for half an hour and get over the hump. And so, I mean, maybe one way to have sold that game would be to do millions of focus tests to force them. Yeah. Oh, obviously, that's not practical. And so we realized you need to be able to figure out by watching someone else playing pretty much what it is you need to do. Or it... Or it needs to be a game very like other games you've already played. But obviously this wasn't the case. You know, this is something new. So if it's that new, it needs to be something you can figure out reasonably quickly. And so with Guitar Hero, that was a big part of the design goal is to try to make it as easy as possible for folks to get over that hump. What was it like when you started seeing, you know, third party devices coming out, um, stuff like you know fancy straps and all the kind of customization that you could get in this whole market like uh, grow around guitar hero oh that's you know always delightful when that sort of sort of thing happens you know you've got to hit when that happens right yeah totally like um 
I thought, uh, what were the kind of differences with gu- guitars as well? Because I remember you kind of released more models and then there was also like the wireless guitars as well, which um, personally I always found the kind of, um, you know, connected wired ones a little bit better than the uh, wireless ones. Uh, that's curious. I'm not sure. Is it because of maybe additional lag or something? What what were the what was the issue you were running? For, for my factor, I think it was the weight. Like I often wow. liked a bit more of a weighty guitar, but it was always down to people's personal preferences as well. There was that uh, triangular one as well, wasn't there? Uh, the the one with the angles. I remember that. Yeah, we we had a really strong push from the market to do the wireless. I think people were tripping over the wire. You know, the, you know, some cases the wire wasn't long enough. You know, there were all sorts of issues people had with the wires. So, you know, we, you know, obviously the wireless is more expensive. So, you know, we, we, uh, we would have made more money if we could keep them all wired. But, you know, we, we did what the market wanted us to do. Was it um, also a bit frustrating kind of having to adapt to different consoles and have it, you know, ported on a uh, different systems and then, people have to kind of, you know, rebuy it to work with that system. Yeah, Guitar Hero 1 was just on the PlayStation 2. And then Guitar Hero 2, which we, you know, we signed with with um, Red Octane before they got bought by Activision, um, was PlayStation 2 and then also on the Xbox. But the Xbox version was delayed. I think the PlayStation came out in for Christmas in November, but the Xbox came out the following spring. Um, the, we had signed to do guitar hero three and, uh, some artist packs and some additional uh, packs, uh, before red octane was sold. But we also had the right in the contract. I made sure we had this right. We had already conceived of Rock Band. We wanted to do Rock Band, and we knew it was going to have a very Guitar Hero-like, you know, element in terms of playing the guitar. We didn't want anything standing in our way of doing that. And so, in the contract, very explicit that we were allowed to do Rock Band, even though it would compete with Guitar Hero. And so, once Activision bought Red Octane, we went back to them and realized we're going to be head to head. You know, we're coming out with rock band. You're going to keep moving with guitar hero, kind of both going after the same market. Us to be doing both at the same time, it's kind of a conflict of interest. I mean, how can we not put the best songs we're able to license into rock band since we're going to own a bigger chunk of rock band than we are of guitar hero. And so we basically agreed to, cancel the contracts for Guitar Hero 3 and the various add-ons and simply let them proceed. They still owed us a royalty, but nowhere near as big a royalty as if we had actually done the games ourselves for them. So we ended up going head-to-head. I mean, they were putting out Guitar Heroes and we were putting out Rock Band and (laughs) we were competing with each other. Of course, we made money on both, but um, we had a much bigger interest in Rock Band. That must have been a bizarre situation, you know, something that you kind of nurtured and promoted and seeing grow that all of a sudden you're then competing against. I mean, was that kind of that separation from Red Octane and then creating Rock Band? Was that kind of a painful era? Was it was it quite awkward? Was it, how, how was it from your perspective? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, at first it wasn't really painful or awkward. Um, I think what ended up becoming more painful was Activision has a tendency to burn out um, various uh, IP. They tend to do too much with it. And they started signing up band after band after band for exclusive versions of Guitar Hero. Well, the, you know, the bigger, very biggest bands didn't want to license their songs into a game along with a whole bunch of other bands. They kind of wanted their own. They wanted themselves to be the you know, the characters in the game and everything. They wanted the whole thing to be devoted to their band. And I can sort of see that, right? But it meant proliferation of games coming out. I think in one year, Activision put out nine different Guitar Hero games. And on our end, we thought they were overdoing it and burning out the market. But we also realized if we didn't, you know, kind of, 
follow in their footsteps, they were going to end up signing up all the best bands and we weren't going to be able to get them. So we had to compete and had to go out and sign up bands and do our own, you know, special band versions of rock band. And so between the two of us, we just totally burned out that market. Well, obviously, I mean, rock band came out after the separation from uh, Guitar Hero. I mean, was it really a direct response to it then? Were, were you guys kind of like, well, we need another product now that let's form our own? And were there any kind of problems in, so far as obviously you kind of knew how Guitar Hero worked, and I guess you didn't want to kind of step on any trademark issues that might arise with Activision? Was it kind of had to be made from the ground up? How did that kind of work? No, Rock Band actually started development before for Guitar Hero 1 shipped. So right, okay. the team that was working on Guitar Hero, you, you finished the game, you know, a couple of months at least before the game actually hit store shelves, right? And we didn't have a commitment to do Guitar Hero 2 because who knew how Guitar Hero 1 was going to sell, right? So what do you do with the team? Well, we had concluded that what we had was, you know, something interesting we also had this concept of doing a full band game rather than just doing guitar. And so we started working on that in summer of 2005. Guitar Hero 1 didn't ship until no around November 1st, 2005. So, and I don't think we signed the contract to do Guitar Hero 2 until a couple of months after Guitar Hero 1 shipped. I think we might have started work on it, just anticipating that it would probably happen but um we didn't have a contract for it until into 2006 as i recall and so we had right. already started work on rock band and it was you know getting pretty well underway by the time we were working on guitar hero 2 also but we were also hiring we started hiring at a faster clip i mean we sold our, the company to viacom in 2006 but you know, we also were able to raise some additional money in 2005 that we could invest in, you know, Rock Band, for instance. We basically said, look, our next game, we want to own it. We don't want to take advances from a publisher and have them get the lion's share of the upside. Well, you mentioned about Viacom there as well. And obviously, you, I believe you were under the MTV Games kind of label, weren't you, on there? Yeah. Um, and obviously having access to, you know, that, that big brand MTV. I mean, did that kind of help get deals with major bands and artists? Like obviously there was the, the ACDC Live and the Beatles pack and that kind of thing. I mean, did, did that having the MTV and Viacom connection really open doors? I think so, yeah. I mean, certainly knowing that there's a big multi-billion dollar company signing a contract um, is, you know, something that a, you know, that a band or, you know, any anybody owning those rights would feel more comfortable that they're going to get paid, right? And that they're not going to have some small company do something that totally embarrasses them in some way. What happened very shortly after we got purchased, so the purchase went through, I think it was October 26th, 2006, if I remember correctly. And literally like two months later, the president of MTV, Van Toffler, was on vacation down in the Caribbean somewhere and um, got invited to a dinner, as he put it, at Bruce and Demi's. <laughs> and I had to laugh because he <laughs> talking about Bruce Willis and Demi Moore, who were like, you know, the most famous Hollywood couple in the world at the time. And at that dinner, um, Olivia Harrison and her son Danny were, were also present. And at some point, Olivia said, oh, you know, Danny has, you know, it, it has become a huge fan of Guitar Hero. And Van said, oh, I just bought the company that made Guitar Hero. Would you like to meet them? And Danny said, yes. So he started the process of what eventually became Beatles Rock Band. That was really the, the genesis of it. Danny started, um, we actually even made Danny a, a special consultant. We gave him, you know, access to the office and everything. He would come up and stay at Alex's house and they would, you know, jam together. Alex plays a number of instruments. Uh, mostly drums, and you know, it became friendly and started a discussion. How might you know we get the Beatles to do something like this? And Danny was savvy enough to know that if he pushed it too hard himself, it would be pushed back 
by others. And so, he, you know, he could only take it so far. Uh, one of the things he advised was we really needed to get the new management of Apple records on board. And there was, had very recently a new, a new president had arrived and he was an American and he was looking to make a mark. And we managed to convince him that doing a game with us, with the Beatles, was a way of getting a whole new generation interested in the Beatles music. And so that started a whole, how then are we going to convince the four key owners of Apple? Each one of them has a veto. So unless all four of them say yes, it doesn't happen, which is one of the reasons the Beatles don't do a whole lot. You know, they're fairly careful. And I, you know, I, I give them credit. They've protected their brand pretty well over time. But you've probably noticed, like, you know, they're the very last to get onto streaming. They were the last yeah, to get on iTunes. Long, they, you know? they didn't get yeah. on iTunes for a very long time. Yeah. And you know, they, they don't tend to take risks like that. So the fact that we managed over the course of a couple of years of creating various prototypes and, you know, Alex going and talking to Sir Paul every few months, just getting everybody kind of interested in this. And finally, I, it took two years to get them to say, okay. And then it took us another year because we'd already done a fair amount of work on it to actually get the game, you know, ready to ship. But that was in many ways, I mean, I think our, our crowning achievement. I mean, many of us feel like by far the best of all of our titles in terms of just the quality of it, but also to be able to pull that off with them and have them all happy was pretty amazing. The night of the press conference at the main industry show in Los Angeles in June of 2009, I sat and spoke with Olivia Harrison for a couple of hours, actually. And at some point, she turned to me and she said, Michael, you have no idea what you've accomplished. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, nothing in the history of the Beatles has ever gone this smoothly. I would have bet that mm. this would have been canceled. At best, it would have been a year late. The fact that you got it done on time it is just amazing. I think that was one of the first times I saw anything major Beatles on on a video game, and that was like, you know, just absolutely huge to see that. Um, do you think that kind of overexposure ended up uh, killing off the series? You know, just so many versions and uh, uh, you know so many titles coming out. I do think that was a big part of it. I think the meltdown of the economy was also a part of it. Um, we had the most expensive games on the market. And if you're going to cut back on your spending because uh, you're getting laid off and everybody around you is getting laid off and the economy is going downhill, you can understand why somebody might not buy the most expensive video game for their, you know, Christmas gift. I think there's that. I think another thing that, that comes into play is it's very, very hard when something is as successful as that, but also has such long uh, delivery times, it's hard to predict how many to make, right? And just as happened in like 1983 or so with the cartridge market, where the, mm. the lead times were even longer, I think they had to commit to quantities something like eight or nine months in advance. And you know, you're, you're selling millions and millions of these cartridges. So like, what do you predict next time? Well, last one sold three million, let's make four, you know, whatever. But when you overdo it, and you end up having a whole bunch of inventory that gets discounted, it suddenly kills the market. It seems like, I think in, in some ways, you'd be better off throwing it all away rather than discounting it. Because if you take the price down, you've set a new standard in people's minds for what these things should cost. And hmm. it's often not sustainable. You can't, you've, you're selling them off at a loss just because it's better than throwing them away. But that means in the next game, you have a really hard time charging the price you really need to charge in order to make any money. And it's interesting because, I mean, you know, today we, we still have some rhythm games. I mean, you know, Dance Dance Revolution is still going and Beat Saber, you know, kind of taking that into virtual reality. I mean, do, do you think there'll be like some kind of larger revival of that kind of genre again? I mean, do you think there's still an appetite for it? I mean, yes, I do think that there's still, you know, there's something sort of basic that's fun about it right and some of these things you know come in waves right something gets overdone and you know 
people move away from it for a while, but then a new generation discovers it or, you know, folks who actually liked it 10 years ago realize maybe I could do it again. I, I do think there's more, it wasn't just a fad. I think there's something in what Iran and Alex told me, you know, day one. I mean, I remember Alex saying to me that music was just fundamental to being human, that going back tens of thousands of years, we sat around campfires and we made music together and that there's Mm. something instinctive in the human brain that enjoys making music. And he wanted to bring back the joy of actually making music as opposed to just simply listening to music, um, which because of technology, you know, the phonograph and the radio and stereo or whatever, we'd moved away from most people being able to make their own music. And he thought using technology, we could bring back that pure joy. Well, Mike, it's been incredible to Here's some stories from your uh, amazing career so far. Um, I was going to ask what you're up to these days. Well, I mean, we kind of touched on it last week, actually, didn't we? That there is, um, I know at the moment, and it's actually available now by the time the show comes out, a brand new version of the Space Bar to celebrate its 25th anniversary. Do you want to just quick remind people about what that's about then for people that maybe missed last week's episode? Ah, yes. Well, Space Bar is, I'd say, Steve Moretzky's magnum opus. I mean, it's the game I think he's most proud of, probably the one he put the most effort and and sweat and blood into you know he's famous for you know, his very first game was uh, uh he made him famous actually planetfall but then he did hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy and leather goddesses of phobos and various other you know massive bestsellers of the you know interactive fiction era um this was his first real uh graphic adventure game and it's got uh it's for its time it you know filled three cds right so it was two gigabytes just comparison planifall was 81k right (laughs) Um, uh, many orders of magnitude larger i think there's five hours of um audio from uh voice actors i think there's something like 22 characters uh basically you're a human police officer on a terrible mining planet Humans are viewed as the lowest of all life forms in the universe. You are also a policeman, so you're you know not very well respected, and you're trying to uh, solve a significant crime. Your partner has just been kidnapped or, or in the process, and so you're left on your own to try to figure this out. And using your empathy telepathy power to dive into the minds of these various aliens, uh, you you figure out the crime. But um, it's very funny, um, has just some fantastic voice talent and uh, characters, and it's very humorous. Well, I'll put a link to uh, the the, uh, the purchase link in our show notes as well, so everyone can just click on that and go straight through to it. Um, definitely worth checking out. And Mike, thanks again for coming on and uh, reminiscing with us and sharing some of your stories. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you.